Well, good afternoon and welcome um, to College Planning 101. I'm Stacey Hanley and this is Catherine Edmonds. I also want to introduce Meredith Ashburn who will be moderating the webinar. So before we begin, Meredith, can you kind of share with people, folks how if they want to submit questions why Catherine and I are speaking, how they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So Stacy and Catherine are going to be covering a lot of really great information today. And so if you find that you have any questions during the presentation, you can find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So go ahead and submit any of your questions there and they will address them at the end of the presentation. Okay, great. So um, Catherine, I'm going to go ahead and just sort of click off my camera and uh, everything so we can do that so everybody can kind of focus on the presentation and not our face and then We'll log on again, so we're gonna get going. Okay. All right, hopefully that worked. Okay. In 1992, I had to make a decision on where to go to college. My parents wanted me to attend my home state university, the University of Georgia, which was close by. The tuition was $4,000 a year, and I had been awarded a scholarship which would pay half that tuition. I wanted to go further away from home and attend my dream school, Washington and Lane, which was about over $13,000 a year. My parents and I had many serious discussions about this decision as my dad's home building company was in the midst of a real estate recession and my parents were really concerned of how they were gonna pay for a WNL tuition, room and board, et cetera. I, on the other hand, thought I'd worked too hard in high school to not to choose my dream school. After much deliberation, my dad told me that I could go, but we we're all gonna to have to make sacrifices and that included selling my car to pay the first semester tuition, which is exactly what I did. During my freshman year at WNL, my dad would send me handwritten notes, such as, you are there for an education, not an experience. As time went by, my dad could see that I was pulling the grades. His notes encouraged me to have some fun, but always with a caveat. Work hard, play hard, but be good. When I graduated in 1996, I remember going to lunch with my parents during graduation weekend. My dad turned to me and said, many people measure their success in different ways. My success is that you graduate from WNL and I paid for it. Flash forward 30 years, and now my son Colin is deliberating on where to go to college. He also wants to go out of state. That WNL tuition my dad sacrificed to pay has gone up 300% since 1996. Times that number by my three kids, and the number is terrifying. And I am sure I'm not the only one who's concerned about paying for my kids' college, or the fact that my 18-year-old son is now an adult. If you're a parent like me who has these concerns, or maybe you're a grandparent who wants to contribute to your grand your grandkids' education, that you are in the right place. Today, you will hear from one of the best experts I know on the subject of paying for college, Catherine Edmonds. I will also discuss with you the legal ramifications of your college-bound child who is now an adult. So please let me introduce Catherine Edmonds, who is the Vice President of the Rand Wealth Management Group. Not only is Catherine a dear friend, she's also my personal financial advisor. So Catherine, please share with us how we are gonna pay for college. <laughs> All right, thank you, Stacy, very much for having me. Uh, for a little background for those on the call, uh, Stacy and I have known each other since middle school, which is a scary thought. Uh, we cheered together, we played basketball together, and have been friends for uh, 30 plus years. So I very much appreciate you in inviting me to speak about this lovely topic of saving for college. Um, there are countless studies that show the importance of a college degree as it relates to future earnings power, but that degree can come at a heavy price tag. According to the College Board, college can cost anywhere from 26,000 to 54,000 on average per year, depending on in-state, out-of-state, public versus private, and just to rub a little salt in the wound, college expenses typically increase each and every year. So historically, college costs increase anywhere from three to 5% annually, some years more, some years less. And again, some of it depends on public versus private school, but suffice it to say, College costs have not been in lockstep with inflation over the last 20 plus years, and it would be hard to assume that uh, they would get in lockstep anytime soon. Most families do not have 100% of college costs saved prior to their child leaving for college. So what can you do to help prepare? 
So the good news is that there are many avenues to help pay for college. While some of these are better than others, in my opinion, it's always good to have several different options available. So let's look at it briefly at a couple of these options before I spend the rest of my time talking about 529s, which in my opinion are um, one of the best ways to save. Few of the more common ones would be a home equity loan or a line of, of credit. Um, a couple of things to remember about that would be that um, money used to pay for education would not be tax deductible. And there are closing costs associated with a line of credit or a, or a home equity loan. And depending on the type of loan that you choose from your home, the interest rate can fluctuate. So um, in a rising interest rate environment, you can get caught uh, having to service that debt. Another pretty common area that people might look towards is their 401k for either a loan or a distribution. Uh, in the case of a loan, the good thing is you're not, you're, you're not paying a bank interest, you're paying yourself interest. There are no closing costs associated with the 401k loan. However, generally these loans are very short term in nature. Um, most require you to pay back within five years. So that kind of defeats the purpose of a, of a college type loan. And these loans are generally limited in um, how much you can take usually either half the lesser of half of the value of your account or $50,000. Um, in some cases, depending on the 401k, you can no longer contribute to that 401k if you have an outstanding balance. So in the case where you might be receiving an employer match, you are now foregoing that free money. Um, and last but not least, this is a tough one that I have to have a conversation with clients often about is that you're taking away from your own retirement. Um, you know, as Stacy mentioned in her intro, one of her father's greatest accomplishments he felt was the fact that he was able to pay for her college education. Um, and a lot of us feel the same way. However, we all have to remember that um, there are ways to subsidize college education and there really are not very many ways to subsidize your own retirement. Um, investments can kind of go along with that if you were to use your investment portfolio outside of your 401k. Um, it, it's actually a fine option other than that there are potential capital gains tax consequences of selling out of your investment portfolio. And then tied into that is if that investment portfolio is earmarked for your retirement, then you are sacrificing your um, retirement goals for, for college education purposes. And the last one that I'll touch on here is financial aid. This is generally in the form of a work study program, needs-based scholarships as opposed to merit-based scholarships. And then, um, of course, loans. These can all be granted by the government and or the individual school. Um, loan interest rates on, for, on uh, student loans, in my experience, can be a little higher than other sources you might be able to um, tap into. However, the loan repayment terms are, are very generous uh, compared to other types of loans. So as I mentioned, um, in my opinion, 529 plans are one of the best tools to sock away money earmarked for college. As with most investments, um, the earlier you start saving, the better off you will be. Uh, let me point out that there are two types of 529 plans. Each definitely has benefits, but they are very different and you need to be sure you know which one you're choosing if you are doing this on your own. Um, a 529 savings plan behaves sort of like a Roth IRA in that you put money in, 
you're choosing the investments and you are subject to market risk um, in, that, in that account. The prepaid tuition plan, on the other hand, um, is a little different in that your contributions guarantee that a certain percentage of tuition at you know, a handful of state colleges will be covered. So in my experience, the 529 savings plans are more common and they are my preference just due to their flexibility. However, certainly the prepaid tuition plans have applicability in some situations. So let's dig a little deeper into these 529 savings plans. Uh, contributions are made on an after-tax basis, although some states do offer some state tax benefits. For those on the webinar that are uh, Georgia residents, Georgia is one of those states that offers some state income tax benefits. So currently, if you invest in the direct sold 529 savings plan sponsored by the state of Georgia, you, and you are a Georgia resident, then you can receive a state tax deduction on up to $8,000 of contributions per beneficiary. And that's if you're filing a joint return, you can get a $4,000 deduction per beneficiary for all other filers. So as an example, I have two children. If I contribute $8,000 to a 529 plan for each of them, I can deduct up to $16,000 on my 2020 Georgia income tax return. In all 529 plans, dividends, interest, capital gains, and any other income grow tax deferred and can be tax free if used to pay qualified education expenses. If not used for qualified education expenses, the earnings portion of your distribution will be subject to ordinary income tax and a 10% penalty. Um, one item of note that is somewhat new is that now 529 plans can be used for K through 12 tuition expenses up to 10,000 per year. This is not something I recommend since you uh, generally get maximum benefit by tax deferral, you know, and uh, on these assets for as long as possible. But it is an option and again has applicability in some situations. Um, some additional advantages to the 529 savings plans is they have a decent bit of flexibility. Uh, the owner on the account can change the beneficiary at any time. The owner maintains control of the investments and the distributions from the account, whether that, you know, whether that owner is a grandparent or a parent or a third party. The 529 plan is also excluded from um, your estate for estate tax purposes. The owner of the 529 can front load contributions to the account without incurring gift tax. There are now also some options for those who have a child that is disabled. It allows uh, funds from in your 529 to be designated for that child while not interfering with um, any uh, government supplemental plans. So as with all investment strategies, there are drawbacks. And the 529 savings plan has a couple of drawbacks, including investment returns are not guaranteed. And the investment options are limited to what is offered by that particular 529 plan that you choose to uh, invest in. Additionally, you can only reallocate the existing balance in your 529 plan twice a year. New contributions you can allocate however you want, but existing contributions can only be changed twice a year. So everybody got all of that, right? I didn't, I didn't uh, overwhelm you with fire spigot. <laughs> but just in case you missed something, I thought a hypothetical case study might help. This is courtesy of my two children. 
Uh, Henry on the left is now 11. Alec is now eight on the right. But let's say we opened 529 savings plans for both of them when they were as young as these pictures. And we have been contributing to them routinely. So for ease of numbers, let's assume that by the time they are 18, we have contributed $100,000 to each of their 529s and the account has grown to 150,000 through investment growth. Again, let me stress, growth is not guaranteed, but we are making an assumption that the accounts have grown over time based on the investments we elected. So Henry is now 18 and he has been accepted to Harvard. We are so excited for him, of course, but we also know that that $150,000 in his 529 plan will maybe like buy books for the semester. <laughs> um, what are our options here? Well, our first option is we can use that 529 plan for qualified education expenses and all 150,000 would be tax free. Number two, maybe we have the ability to use current income to allow uh, to pay for education and allow the 529 plan to keep growing for future years. Number three, if financial aid is a possibility, then I want to wait to use the 529 plan until the last two years of school so that the income from the 529 plan will not negatively impact my, uh, or not my, but Henry's FAFSA application. The FAFSA application is the financial aid, the federal financial aid form. And it is generally using um, your two years prior tax information. And income to a child, it penalizes you much more so than um, assets of the parent, and in the case of assets of the grandparent, that is not taken into account at all. So if there's still money in the 529 account, I can let it grow. Um, I can change the beneficiary. I can change that beneficiary to myself if I want to and let it continue to grow maybe until I am in my 80s and I'm in a lower tax bracket and I can use that money for myself I will owe income tax and possibly a penalty, but those decades of tax deferral could be beneficial to me. I can change the beneficiary to a sibling. I could maybe even wait until I have grandchildren and change the beneficiary to my grandchild. There could be issues of generation skipping there, but it is an option. I can also take the money out and, you know, put an addition on my house, pay income tax on the growth. So in this case, we had, we had put $100,000 in and had $50,000 of growth. If we take that whole amount out, I would pay income tax on the 50,000 of growth as well as a 10% penalty because I did not use it for qualified education expenses. So while we're on this uh, dream of Henry getting into Harvard, let's assume that he also gets a full ride. So do I lose everything in my 529 plan? Absolutely not. I have all the same options that I just mentioned, plus I have one other option. If I take out the equivalent amount of the scholarship in the same calendar year as the scholarship is awarded, then the 10% penalty on earnings is waived. I will still pay ordinary income tax, but I will not have to pay that 10% penalty. All right, moving on to my sweet Alec, who, um, by the way, does not know that he is my um, not going to college example in my case study. <laughs> so please keep that to yourself if you know him or if you ever meet him, please do not tell him <laughs> that he was my not going to college example. 
I only used him as this example because the picture worked. So I feel like I need to say that that's my disclaimer, that it has nothing to do with his personality or our assumptions about his future. Um, but moving on, Alec has decided that college isn't for him. Remember, we have this $150,000 uh, 529 plan of which he is the beneficiary. He has instead decided he wants to go travel the world. Well, luckily, I have several options with respect to his 529 as well. Number one, I can keep that 529 right where it is in hopes that he changes his mind at some point down the road. Number two, I can change the beneficiary on the account. Number three, I can take that money out for my own benefit, or I can even give it to him and he will pay ordinary income tax at his tax bracket, which may be zero. And he will then also pay a 10% penalty on that 50,000 of gain. So in summary, 529 savings plans provide a lot of flexibility, potential income tax and estate tax benefits, all while the owner maintains control of the investments and distributions. So that is a win, 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 win in my book. I'm gonna pass the baton back over to Stacy, who's gonna close us out with some additional um, good information to be aware of once your child is heading off to college. Thanks Kat for that information. So in addition to paying for college, we also have to worry about the fact that when our kids turn 18 and head off to college, they are now, for all intents and purposes, adults. At age 18, your child holds most rights and privileges of adulthood. This includes the right to vote, the right to obtain credit cards, and enter into contracts without parental consent. 18-year-olds are eligible for jury duty and are responsible for filing and paying income taxes on time. 18-year-olds can get married and drop out of school without your consent. 18-year-olds can get sued. They can be tried as an adult for a DUI, a drug offense, an over-container violation. If your 18 year old has his or own checking account, he can spend his money as he sees fit. If your 18 year old is a boy, he must also register with the National Selective Service, Service, in other words, the draft. So we as parents must prepare ourselves and our 18 year olds to be adults, which is what the law deems them. While we may be able to exert some level of control over them, if we still control the purse strings, we should still have certain legal documents in place so that we can help our children navigate this transition to adulthood. So what are the legal documents you need in place before your child heads off to college? There are a general power of attorney, an advanced directive for healthcare, and depending on how you feel about this, a FERPA waiver, which we will talk about. So first let's talk about the general power of attorney. How does a general power of attorney work? Under a power of attorney, your child can designate someone or more than one person to act in his or her name and exercise his or her rights with respect to any property your child may own. Like, well, what does that mean? That means that you basically can transact as your child's agent, transact any business on behalf of your child. So for example, you could file their income tax returns. You could apply for unemployment insurance for them. You can access their bank records and electronic communications. When children are doing this, this form, I suggest that they name both parents as their co-agents with each parent having the authority to act alone in case one parent is not available. So let's look at an example of how this works. Sally and Bob are sending their son, Jack, who is a sophomore at UGA, $2,000 a month in living expenses. The money gets deposited into a checking account in Jack's name only. Jack pays his apartment rent of $600 a month and is responsible for the rest of his living expenses. Jack is blowing through this money and is always asking for more money by the end of the month. Sally and Bob want to know how Jack is spending this money. What rights do Sally and Bob have to access Jack's checking account? Well, the answer pretty much is none. If Bob and Jack were joint owners of the checking account, then Bob could access the account records. If Bob is not on the account, then how does he access these records? The answer is with a general power of attorney. As Jack's agents, Bob could access the records, look at the transaction history. 
Now let's suppose Sally and Bob are appalled to see that Jack's monthly budget consists of Uber rides, beer runs, DoorDash transactions, bar tabs, et cetera. Sally and Bob want to control how Jack is spending this money. Will the power of attorney let them do that? The answer is no. The power of attorney does not stop Jack, the principal, from acting. Basically, Sally and Bob would just have to be able to cut Jack's budget. So how else will a general power of attorney help Jack, Sally, and Bob? Let's say Jack has signed a, a lease for an apartment, and Jack is now sending abroad for the semester and wants to provide notice that he is not going to extend the lease. Bob, as Jack's agent, can provide the termination notice or negotiate a new lease on Jack's behalf. The other document I strongly suggest that children have executed before they head to college is an advanced healthcare directive, which also includes a HIPAA authorization. Under this, this advanced directive for healthcare, your child delegates someone of his or her choice the power to exercise virtually all rights he or she has to accept or reject medical care. So your child's doctor can rely on the power holder to make all medical decisions, including the power to continue or terminate life support systems. So under this advanced healthcare directive, you can admit or discharge your child from any hospital or other medical facility. You can also basically request medical records with this healthcare directive. So let's go back to Jack, Bob, and Sally. Let's suppose Bob and Sally received an explanation of benefits notice from their insurer. That, that notice details a visit by Jack to St. Mary's Hospital ER, but without much information. Sally and Bob want to contact St. Mary's to find out what happened with Jack, and they want all the records of the hospital visit. The advanced healthcare directive and, and the general power attorney basically grant them HIPAA authorization to access those records. Let's also suppose in a terrible scenario, Jack ends up hospitalized in a medically induced coma. With an advanced healthcare directive, Sally and Bob can authorize and consent to medical treatment and procedures for Jack. If Sally and Bob think that Jack needs to go to rehab and take a semester off from school, can they force Jack to do this as his healthcare agents? The answer is no. As healthcare agents, Sally and Bob do not have the power to make healthcare decisions for Jack regarding involuntary treatment for addictive disease or mental illness. Jack would have to do that on his own accord, or they would have to go to court and get a court order. Most parents, are most parents who are paying for their kids' college are surprised to learn that schools must have written permission from their child, the student, in order to release any information from a student's education record to a parent. This, is, this law is under the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So basically your child, and most schools provide this form, has to sign a form allowing the records to be released to your parents. If you don't have this form, then your child will have to turn over his report card to you when it comes out. So congratulations, you have now completed College Planning 101. While Catherine and I have sort of provided you the general framework on paying for college and preparing for your child's transition to adulthood, we know that every situation is unique. So we encourage you to speak to a financial advisor or a state planning lawyer about your particular situation. And of course, you can always reach out to me or Catherine if you have any questions or concerns. So I think at this point, Meredith, we will open up for um, any questions that have been submitted. Yeah, so we, we actually have a few questions that came in. The first one is, I heard 529 plans had to be distributed by age 30. Is that true? So I'll take that one. Um, that is not true. 529 plans can be held indefinitely. Um, I think what they may be confused about is what's called an educational, uh, Coverdell ed ESA, educational savings account. Those do in fact have to be liquidated by age 30. All right, the next question is, can I have more than one 529 plan for the same beneficiary? You can, yes, you can have as many uh, 529 plans as you want for the same beneficiary at diff in, with different 529 accounts. Um, if you are the one that is contributing to those plans, you just need to be careful about gifting. The third question says, I am pregnant now. Can I set up a 529 plan for my unborn child with monetary gifts I have received from others? That would be nice, um, but no. You have to have, the beneficiary has to have a social security number. 
Um, so you would have to wait for that child to be born before you could set up a 529 plan for them. Now, one other option could be that you set it up now naming yourself as beneficiary. And then when your child is born, you can then um, change the beneficiary to that child. All right, the next question is, I want to set up educational trusts for my grandchildren. What are the advantages of a 529 account versus a trust for education? And can a trust make a contribution to a 529 plan? Catherine and I debate this a lot. Um, I get clients who want to set up trusts, whether it's health, education, maintenance, and support of, you know, their grandchildren or children. And I think Catherine, you, had, you know, was sort of advised that it's a little more, you know, advantageous set up a 529 plan as to put money in a trust. So Catherine, kind of tell us why that is. Um, so a, 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 a 529 can, yeah, excuse me. A 529 plan can, um, the owner can actually be a trust. Um, but generally, I think there's just more flexibility associated with just having that 529 plan um, owned outright by the grandparents. Um, again, they can control the uh, investments, they can control the distributions, and um, can change those beneficiaries to the extent that they want to. Whereas a trust, um, you can do those things as well. It just uh, takes a little more um, effort, certainly, to change the beneficiaries of a trust. Right. Changing the beneficiaries is not an easy task in a trust. It requires, um, it may require, you know, going to court to do it. It may require getting consent of the beneficiaries to do it. Or no, So it's not, it's not an easy task if that's something that you want, you know, flexibility in who the beneficiaries, beneficiaries are of the money once you create the trust. All right, the next question is, we set up a UTMA account for our child and a significant amount of money has accumulated in this account from gifts from relatives over the years. It's my understanding that my child has full access to this account at age 21, but what if I'm concerned that my child will blow through all of this money? What are my options? Yeah, no, um, yeah. so this is, like, this is like a custodian for minor account. Like I've set them up for my kids where we get like birthday gift money or Christmas gift money. There's an account that's set up in the name like my husband and let's say Colin Hanley. So, and you know, money starts accumulating from gifts and they haven't put in 529 plans. Well, at 21, um, Colin gets access to that money. I mean, there's nothing we can do to stop them. If I wanted Colin not to spend it, I would have to convince Colin to basically you know, put that money into a trust for himself and give somebody else, you know, control over it. And whether Colin's willing to do that or not, I would have to threaten however many other things or, or entice him with some other carrot for him to basically give up access to that money. So there's other avenues of gifting that you have relatives that want to give money, especially significant money. I think a 529 plan is a better spot to put the money. Catherine, what do you think of that? I do too. Um, and you know those those custodial accounts can, you know, I I always suggest going ahead and try to use those uh, before 21 for the very reason that the question was asked. You know, once that once they turn 21, literally the account is frozen on that 21st birthday. The account is frozen, and nothing can happen with it until it is changed into that child's individual name. Um, so I always try to encourage people to go ahead and use that money, draw it down for car, school, um, you know, anything that is, um, that, that is allowable under those accounts, go ahead and spend that money on before they reach age 21. All right, we have another question that just came in, which says, are there restrictions to putting funds back into the 529 if the school issues a refund, for example, for COVID-related shutdowns? So Jen, that's a great question. Um, and obviously it's coming up a lot right now. Um, they, you generally have 60 days, I believe, to roll money back in from the date of the refund. All right, and then the last question is, I am divorced and do not want my ex-husband to be my healthcare agent. 
can I name my daughter who is now 18? Yes, you absolutely can. That's another, as you know, your child now as an adult can be agents under your own power of attorney and your own healthcare directive. I see a lot of situations where if there's been a you know, single parent, they will name, if both of their kids are over the age teen, co-agents under their healthcare directive. If you think your child can handle that responsibility, then they absolutely can serve in that capacity. All right, that was the end of all the questions that we received in the Q&A box. Great, okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And again, um, our contact information is on the screen. If you have specific questions to yourself that you don't wanna put in a general Q&A box, please feel free to reach us anytime. Um, both Catherine and I obviously do free consultations and just um, you know, anytime. So if you have a question or concern, please do not hesitate to contact us. So thank you for joining us. Thank you.